microdosing is a great entry point to develop the skill of psychedelics and that the more we become aware of these different medicines and these different doses and especially great providers who can help us navigate it, the more effective these experiences can be for us. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and today we're going to be talking again with Paul Austin, who's a leader in psychedelic work. As we mentioned on our last episode, psychedelic work over the past few years has been revealed as a cutting-edge modality for dealing with things ranging from addictions, trauma, to even high performance. And this is where our conversation comes into it today, which is in architecture, let's face it, you're faced all the time with creativity, innovation, adapting to changes. We have things like AI who are going to be impacting the industry. We have big forces we're against in terms of humanity, climate change, geopolitical forces. There's a lot going on. And so it really feels that this resurgence of the benefits of psychedelics is just this brave new frontier that Paul was so kind to talk to us about last time. He's an expert in this field. He's impacted, him and his companies have impacted millions of people through safe and effective psychedelic experiences through his company, Third Wave. He's been featured in Forbes magazine, Rolling Stone, the BBC, uh, Work Life, as well as Business of Architecture. He's an evangelist for integrating psychedelics with personal transformation and professional success. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Paul, welcome back to the show. Thanks. It's great to it's great to be back. Uh, I love how we record these back to back and then kind of dive into a different topic each time. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking about getting into microdosing today. Yeah, beautiful. I know I always love that. Um, you know, when we do the back to back thing, which I do sometimes, you kind of pretend like it's a new day. It's like, hey, right, it's good yeah. talking to you last time. You're like, yeah, five <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> Yeah, it's fun. So, um, uh, well, first of all, I just want to acknowledge you, Paul. I didn't do that on the last episode, but just really acknowledge you for like like taking this on because this is a new field, very very new. Let's face it, you got to be a little bit a little bit crazy to jump into <laughs> something so new, right? There's a little part of you that's like, uh, you know, I was like, I'm I'm in for something big here. So it's definitely not something anyone would take on. You're pushing boundaries. Uh, you're you're pushing you're you're reeducating. You're faced with misconceptions, which we talked about on the last episode. But just in case people miss that one, would you give us a brief summary of what psychedelics are, some of the myths around them, and then the realities of those myths, the truth? For sure. As, so as far we'll as keep we know it sh- so far. We'll keep it short. So I'll do the really brief the really brief summary. So psychedelics came back on the scene in the '60s. LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca, DMT. These are the most common psychedelics. They often, at high doses, are highly therapeutic. Um, Some of them have been used for thousands of years. And unfortunately, in the 1960s, uh, prohibition of psychedelics became quite prominent. There were over a thousand clinical papers published on the efficacy of LSD in particular for a range of clinical conditions, but it became associated with the anti-war movement in Vietnam. And for that reason, it's been prohibited and illegal globally for basically the last 50 years. And it's unfortunate because uh, much of the public education over the last 40 years has not been honest. Uh, It's not been accurate. 
uh, has been, um, it's, I mean, there's no other way to put it than it's been a propaganda machine as it relates to psychedelics specifically. And what we know from actual clinical research is that these are not addictive. In fact, they help with addiction, that they have incredible medical value that's been established for well over 70 years. And that, um, the stigma that exists around psychedelics, I think is quickly changing. Uh, in fact, just two stats that might help to to land this. 61% of Americans now support legal psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. This was a research survey that Cal Berkeley did recently. So the majority of Americans now support legal psychedelics and the number of Americans who took a psychedelic has quadrupled in the last four years, which we would include you as part of that, Enix. So there's been a massive uptick of interest and a lot of people are um, noticing that these are really effective tools, and I've just made it my mission uh, as a as a as a human here to support the education and eventually integration of psychedelics, so people can benefit from using them in a intentional and responsible way. Beautiful, Paul. Tell us about how people can use some of these best practices for psychedelics and the different modalities you talked about. Microdosing. What is that? Tell us how we can use these substances, and if we're interested in them, some next steps that we can take to to find out more about this world and and have it help us. Yeah. So I I really view microdosing as a bridge to accessibility. That taking a very low dose of a psychedelic two or three times a week for a period of one month to two months. Uh, it's something that a lot of folks can, can get behind. In fact, I'll tell a, a brief story. You know, I grew up in a pretty religious and uh, traditional family unit in Michigan in the Midwest. And um, when I started to become interested in psychedelics, my dad, who, like you, uh, barely ever, has never been drunk, has never smoked weed, you know, just sort of like, does everything to the T at church every Sunday, works for a Christian college university. He, he read Michael Pollan's book that came out in 2018, How to Change Your Mind. And he became interested in microdosing and started microdosing. And then about a year after that, I actually guided him through a high dose uh, psilocybin experience. And for me, that speaks to the power of microdosing that for anyone who's listening to this, who's like, I'm curious in psychedelics, but I might be a little too intimidated to jump in the deep end right away um, and go straight for, you know, the big shot. Some people are like, I'd like to sort of ease my way in and take these micro doses, uh, lower doses, one, two, three times a week and see how it makes me feel. And so that I think is important. And a lot of the benefits of microdosing are similar to high doses and that people notice they're less depressed. People have more energy. They have a better mood. Um, microdosing, when done consistently, helps to facilitate greater neuroplasticity in the brain, which is partly what we talked about in the last uh, episode together. And uh, the core difference is that microdosing is done over a period of 30 to 60 to 90 days. It's a protocol. It's something you do over an extended period of time. A high-dose therapeutic use is, as you experience, it's a weekend or it's a week long retreat, or it's a, you know, one high dose experience. And you might only do that every six months to year to maybe even two years, depending on who you are. Or you might only do it once or twice in your life and be, and like, feel like that's totally and completely enough, which is also great, you know? And so the, the metaphor that I often use to describe this relationship, just to help it land a little bit better, is like going to the dentist. You know, every six months we go to the dentist, we get a deep, uh, hygienic, clean, things feel amazing. And as we all know, every day we show up, we brush our teeth, hopefully twice a day, we floss, you know, we use mouthwash uh, to, keep the, to keep the mouth clean. Uh, but things just naturally build up over time. And there seems to be a similar relationship between high doses of psychedelics. It's almost, instead of a hyg uh, an oral hygiene cleanse, it's more of a deep spiritual and holistic cleanse. Uh, mind, body, spirit is what I would consider it to be. And um, and then there's microdosing or there's meditation or there's breath work or there's yoga or there's nature walks or there's whatever the modality is that helps you to stay centered and alive and vital. Those are the daily practices that we, we weave in, just like we brush our teeth every day. And I think that 
relationship, that approach is helpful, especially for people who are new to this. Or, you know, a lot of people get into this and they do it too often, right? That, um, you know, they, they fall in love with it a little too much. And so they're drinking ayahuasca every week or they're doing mushrooms every two weeks. And that can sometimes just be a passing phase, right? Like there are some folks who do that in a year because they've been struggling or there's been a lot of challenges. But when it becomes too often, it, it also has some, some downsides, you know. So I think these are to be used cautiously. They're, they're to be used with reverence, ideally with some form of professional support. So that's a lot of what I focused on over the last three years has been training coaches, practitioners, doctors, clinicians, and how to work with psychedelics. And that, um, that professional support makes a world of difference as you experience, as I've also experienced having someone who is there to support you, who helps you prepare beforehand, who maybe helps you integrate afterwards, uh, with different tools and modalities, um, that, that makes the difference between just another drug experience where a lot of the insights and downloads are fleeting and they kind of come through and then they go out compared to an actually transformative experience where there are tangible and productive things that change in your everyday life, which I think all of us who are listening to this podcast can, can resonate with. We're entrepreneurs. We're building the real world. Reality does matter. And so we are uh, always looking out for a tool that um, think that will make us more effective and, and more helpful for society, for ourselves, our family and society at large. How, Paul, how is a, how is a microdose differentiated from like, from a, a macrodose or a larger dose? Like what does it actually mean uh, that something's a microdose? Yeah. So it means it's sub intoxicating is the phrase that I am currently using to describe microdosing. Some people would categorize it as being sub-perceptual, meaning you don't feel anything at all, but then people get hung up and really confused. What I found is, I feel it, do I not feel it, do I feel it, do I not feel it, do I feel it, do I not feel it, right? And so it actually can cause some anxiety. So what I tell folks is sub-intoxicating, maybe you feel things a little bit, but you're not intoxicated. You can do your sort of navigate everyday life as you as you normally would. Uh, it's about a tenth of a regular dose. So a typical microdose of LSD might be anywhere from 5 to 25 micrograms of LSD. Uh, and psilocybin might be anywhere from 50 to 250 milligrams of psilocybin mushrooms. And like I said, that's done twice a week, maybe upwards of three times a week, depending on the protocol that's used. And what we always coach and advise people on is, as I mean, you, you said this perfectly when you were describing your own experience, that this is a catalyst, that this is not a magic pill. This isn't something that's to be done every day for the rest of your life, that there's a window of neuroplasticity, like we talked about before, that opens up within a microdosing protocol and that uh, on our path of progress, development, growth, whatever it might be, uh, it actually makes us, it makes it easier to change behaviors and behavioral change is at the core of every transformative process. You're looking at the sort of tangible and productive difference in your life. If you go to that seminar, go to that retreat or, you know, do that breath work or whatever it might be, uh, work with a psychedelic. And I think psychedelics do that better than I would argue better than almost any other modality that is, that is out there. Um, and as you've experienced microdosing, then, then, mitigates that intensity, right? So with Clarivita, it's it's high dose, it's therapeutic, it's it's deep, you're going in. Um, microdosing is more like a whisper, whereas uh, this high dose therapeutic experience is more like someone is shaking you to get the message. And that can be intense. That can be a lot to navigate. There can be challenge and difficulty in that. People um, can really go through it. It does require even, you know, it requires a lot of courage just to go through with it in the first place. Um, and so I love the sort of pair and combination of what I call the skill of psychedelics, which is depending on the context, depending on the intention, depending on why you're interested in working with psychedelics, you know, this experience may be better for you compared to that experience. A high dose might be better for you compared to a microdose. Mushrooms might be better for you compared to LSD, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So really looking at that, that sort of matrix of options um, 
And then a great coach, practitioner, guide, therapist should I, should know enough about the various medicines and the various dosages and also, also other modalities that you can combine with microdosing or psychedelics. I love yoga with microdosing or I love to do sauna kind of cold plunge, hot cold thermogenesis. Uh, I'll do body work, uh, a certain type of body work called rolfing with certain psychedelics. Uh, I do, uh, I go on hiker doses. So I take a, a low dose of a psychedelic and go hiking. So, um, I think if there's one takeaway from this, this conversation, it's that microdosing is a great entry point to develop the skill of psychedelics. And that the more we become aware of these different medicines and these different doses, and especially great providers who can help us navigate it, the more effective these experiences can be for us. Paul, what would you say to people who are like, yeah, you guys are just a bunch of druggies. I mean, you did it the first time and now you're going back every three months and I think you're addicted to it. What's your response to that? That's a great question. So one, I, I always point to the sort of evolutionary biology of what it is to be a human being. And I'm, I'm fully of the belief that um, there are certain practices that have stood the test of time that are clearly helpful, essential, necessary for a human being to be happy, to thrive, to enjoy life, to be curious, et cetera, et cetera. I wouldn't say that has to be psychedelics, but it's certainly drugs and certainly altered states of consciousness that there is something deep within us as a human being that feels com com obligated even to alter our consciousness in certain ways. Uh, it's very rare that someone hasn't drank like Mormons, uh, Mormons are an exception, obviously, in American culture in terms of no caffeine, no alcohol, no, right, all of that, none. And certain um, uh, Christ Christianity traditions also have that. I think the Seventh-day Adventists are also quite strict in that way. Um, but the vast majority of people, 95% of people, uh, are curious about this. Animals. Elephants, monkeys, it's something in our evolution that, that drives for that. So that's usually one thing I root in. The second thing I root in is I just look at the science of it. And just like, you know, science has shown that exercising more often might be, be is, is more beneficial and helpful, but exercising way too much could actually have certain negative consequences. Drinking water is another great example, right? Like we drink a certain amount of water because it's healthy, but if you drink too much water, it can be negative. Um, and I think psychedelics are similar, that we have longitudinal data on people doing occasional high doses of psychedelics over a period of time, and it's perfectly safe and healthy and actually has a lot of positive and beneficial aspects to it. Um, there's also data on people who do way too many psychedelics, and there's not there's some negative things around that. But doing and having a therapeutic journey or dose every few months, even three months, every three to six months for a period of years, from the science and the clinical research that we have, um, it's pretty clear that the, the the majority of the outcomes are beneficial and that therapeutic support or coaching support is helpful as part of that process. Um, so I look at psychedelic work Partly, especially with microdosing more as a supplement. So just like I might take fish oil or there's tons of great research on creatine in terms of its efficacy as a supplement. Uh, I really look at microdosing as this is something that I, when I cycle on and cycle off it, it's not something I'm doing every day. It's not even something I'm doing every week. I may take two, three, four weeks off, even eight weeks off at a time, but I still do it pretty often. Um, and I feel like and we've seen this in the clinical research as well, there's a physiological benefit to just strictly taking these low doses of psychedelics, just like there's a physiological benefit to taking fish oil, probiotics, uh, creatine, even lion's mane, there's been clinical research on. And so I would also look at specifically microdosing and low dosing within that realm and aspect that physiologically it helps with uh, reducing inflammation. These substances are anti-inflammatory and inflammation is sort of the root of a lot of modern disease and that they also help with neuroplasticity as we've talked about prior. Yeah, what would you say about people who they, they, they're like, oh yeah, I had a friend that did ayahuasca and they came back and he left his wife and abandoned his family or, or abandoned his business. What do you say about people who bring up those kind of stories? What's up with that? 
Yeah, these. This is. What's a good way to frame it? I would say a good parallel is like FTX, right? And the reason I even mention FTX is because in the crypto space, as in any emerging space, you're there's there's it's an emerging space. It's new. It's exciting. It's cutting edge, and at times it's hard to tell the real from the not real, the ethical and integrous actors from the not so ethical and integrous actors, and time is required for that to play out on a broader sort of lens and basis. And the reason I mention that is because with psychedelics, it's still quite early. There's still not a lot of great public education out there. We still have a dearth of really, I would say, high quality integrous providers, although that's changing every day. More and more providers are being trained. And so the simple fact of the truth is a lot of people who work with psychedelics don't have, I would say, qualified professional support to help them navigate what is uh, oftentimes a very liminal space in their lives. Uh, you could also call it an, sometimes an unstable place in their lives that part of the upside of what psychedelics do is they interrupt our default mode and they introduce entropy and chaos uh, because oftentimes, as you, as you even communicated, our lives become too orderly and that becomes sort of emotionless and feelingless. And so psychedelics are this sort of primordial tool that open up a capacity to feel and, you know, I'll do all these exciting things. Sometimes that just goes overboard and people go way off the deep end. This happens, it can happen with ayahuasca. It also happens with 5-MeO-DMT, which is the toad venom that people smoke. Uh, and almost always it's because they did way too much in a, uh, contained period of time. They did not have the necessary professional support to help them navigate that terrain in a appropriate way. And at the, at, at the end of the day, there are still some changes that needed to happen and needed to be done. So this isn't to say that someone going and take, working with ayahuasca and then, you know, a month later, or three months later, separating or divorcing from their partner, that it wasn't the right decision. In some cases, it is. In some cases, the, the difficult and extreme decision is the one that needs to be made. But it is quite commonplace that people will make decisions that they will later regret because they've made them in a uh, brief period after working with psychedelics. And so what we tell everyone that we work with is don't make any major decisions for at least 30 days after some very deep and intense psychedelic work because only after about a month has gone by will the... Uh, excitement uh, subside, and then you can have that insight and download and still make a more sober uh, level decision about how you want to move forward. Beautiful. Paul, thanks for being on here with us today. And where can people go find out more about your resources and what you offer? Yeah, this is this is a ton of fun. I'm glad we, we got to do this. So the thethirdwave.co, or you can just type in third wave or third wave microdosing or Paul Austin microdosing into into Google, but the thethirdwave.co is, is, is our website. And then if there are any people who are interested in doing work with us, we offer a coaching program with a high dose uh, psychedelic experience that's called personalized psychedelic coaching. You can find out details about that on third wave. And then I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Paul Austin three W. So if anyone is a social person here, uh, send me a DM or a note. I'm pretty active on both of those platforms and I'd love to be in touch and answer any questions that you might have. Cool. All right, Paul. Thanks. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah. One more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. 
Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.